Let's see, about one week before Pearl Harbor, I turned 16. I talked to my parents to try to talk them into allowing me to enlist, but they unfortunately, I mean fortunately rather, uh, they would not. So I had a real good year, my senior year in high school athletically, so I was thankful. I got up to uh, boot camp in uh, Great Lakes Naval Training Center, and I had primarily uh, young men from North and South Carolina. They put us in there alphabetically. In the bunk above me or below me was a kid from South Carolina. He was 14 years old. His mother had lied and signed for him. He cried himself to sleep every single night. Uh, I'm surprised I didn't have to head for the psychiatric ward or someplace before I got out of boot camp. Um, we took some tests and somehow, someway, they informed me that I would be going to a sonar school, underwater sound uh, detection for submarine warfare. And there were two schools, Key West, Florida, San Diego, California. I was eventually st uh, stationed out in San Diego. And after the sonar training out here, uh, I was assigned to Camp Shoemaker, which is on dry land. Sometime along the way, they said that you are being assigned to a ship up in Mare Island near uh, San Francisco. And it turned out it was the USS Claxton DD-571. It was one of eight destroyers uh, in what was called the, nicknamed the Little Beaver Squadron. And Little Beaver was a little Indian boy in the old Red Rider comic strips, which is, has been out of circulation for quite a number of years, as far as I know. Uh, the the uh, ship had run the slot at Guadalcanal. In the entire duration of World War II, there was one destroyer squadron that received the presidential unit citation, and that was the squadron, uh, uh, destroyer squadron 23. I have a license plate right now, DESRN 23, which is short for destroyer squadron 23. Uh, I was not on that tour of duty, obviously, but I caught them. They got hit in the fantail in the rear of the ship uh, by a shore battery, and so they were sent back to Mare Island for repairs. And that's where I was assigned to the ship. <clears throat> we, uh, these guys had been over around Guadalcanal, so for a reward, they sent them up and down the west coast on a mail run, three days in, four days out, or vice versa in San Francisco, which was great duty. Not for me. <clears throat> I literally carried a bucket aboard that ship the entire time. I, I came up green, the bile. Uh, <laughs> every single time we were out. Thank goodness when we left the west coast and headed for Pearl Harbor, that was, that was the end of it. I was never seasick from then on, but, but it was sure tough those few months on that run. Uh, the USS Claxton was named for a lieutenant killed in the Battle of Lake Erie in 1813. Uh, one time on uh, Liberty in San Francisco, I was with a 27-year-old. Remember, I was 17 when I went in, 20 when I got out in 1946. And this guy was 27. We got in and ordered zombies. Supposedly, back in those days, one zombie would knock you flat. We had about three apiece, and obviously they, they had been watered down because we walked out of there as sober as judges. But when we got outside, uh, he started cursing me up one side, and I said, what's the matter? He says, you hot dog? He says, I'm in there about 5'7", 135 pounds, this guy asked for my ID. He didn't say a word to you. Of course, I, <laughs> I was underage the whole time I was in the Navy. Uh, one time on Easter vacation, I had a chance to catch a troop ship and fly back to, to my hometown of Charleston, Illinois, and I had a chance to see my, who is now my wife, my girlfriend back then for a few days. On the way back, we were flooded in Kansas City. I called the officer of the day on my ship, the OD, and informed him that I wouldn't be, wake, make it back on time. So obviously I was absent without official leave, AWOL, so I was uh, stationed aboard the ship for about two weeks. So fortunately that, that was much better than being sent to the brig or something. We had a practice loading machine on our ship. I was the first loader uh, on, during general quarters when we were under attack. The, and the first loader handled the shell, 52 pound uh, shell, five inch shell. And so we had a practice loading machine on our ship, and I'd go down there and practice once in a while. And fortunately, it turned out that it was actually a, a good way to get exercise. I, I was 
aware of Charlie Atlas and all that sort of thing, but, but I never did anything of that sort, but, but that did help. We had a guy on our ship on that first tour. I never met the gentleman. He was a ship steward, so ship stewards on our ship, the only blacks on our ship were ship stewards or African Americans. And they told me that this guy could take a 52-pound shell, he was the first loader also, with one hand and pop it in the breech. I, I did it with two hands, and I had my hands full, so you know, we could, sometimes you were throwing those babies in there as fast as you could grab one. So it's a pretty good workout. Uh, we had, uh, we stopped off at Pearl Harbor to, to uh, take on supplies and everything. When we left Pearl Harbor, I took one sip of uh, powdered milk and spat it out or spit it out, whichever, and that was the end of that. So I, I drank coffee back then to keep awake like most of us did, and so I'd use pet milk. Had about half coffee and about half pet milk, and uh, that worked out fine for me. But anytime with cereal or anything else, I did that. One of our main meals in the morning was uh, SOS. That was, the first word was S-H something on a shingle. That was, that was hash, hash on a piece of toast. Uh, but it must have worked because I got up to 207 pounds while I was in the Navy, and currently I weigh about 182 or thereabouts. Uh, then we headed for, I had a 13-month tour of duty, which was much shorter than some of these gentlemen, and also Harriet, by far. And we uh, hit the Palau Islands. Peleliu was one of the bloodiest battles uh, in the Pacific, as I have found out. And I was uh, interested, I can still hear some of those Navy pilots, they were so gung-ho, man, I spot one, I'm gonna go get them, you know, just like that. They were really gung-ho. And we were sitting about 10 miles out guarding baby aircraft carriers. Uh, at, at that particular campaign. Then we had orders to proceed to the Philippines for the retaking of the Philippines. On the way up there, we hit a typhoon, which is a hurricane out here and a typhoon out that way. And as I looked out, it was like sheets of water, like a gray curtain all around. I looked over at battleships that we had. Uh, we had the Tennessee for sure. I, I think maybe the California, I'm not, I don't know positively, but they were bouncing along in there like some little kid would take his little boat and bounce it in the bathtub. Uh, it, it was uh, an eerie sight for me, and of course I was on a destroyer, a much smaller ship, and we were listing quite, quite heavily either way. But uh, and when we would go to uh, another station, we would grab a hold of the of the line here along the side of the ship to to pull ourselves up uh, in a in a typhoon situation. Uh, the in the uh, Philippines, we were engaged in the well. We, we came in the convoys like this. My ship, the Claxton, was right here at the apex, so I had the privilege of being on board the first warship to go back in to retake the Philippines. We had uh, minesweepers in there for about three days before we arrived, uh, you know, to kind of clear things out. And then the first night we were there in the Leyte Gulf area, we were ordered to fire a star shell every 15 minutes, and that would light, you know, make the black of night light up like day. And later on, the center on my high school football team, he, he, he and his future wife and my future wife and I were double dating. And it turns out that Kenny was in, uh, on shore that night. And see, boy, we were sure thankful for those star shells and to light things up because you never knew whether you were firing at your own uh, comrades or at the enemy sometimes. Uh, then we had the uh, Battle of Surigao Strait. And we sat back about 15 miles guarding battleships. And this was one of the most beautiful July 4th type celebrations I've ever observed. Those battleships would fire those 16 inches, 15 miles, and you know, just a beautiful sight in the air uh, of the trail of those shells as they were being fired. The Japanese, for some reason, would come up to about right here and turn around, right here, and boy, we were just laying and just, you know, socking it to them big time. So that was one of the major naval victories of World War II. It, uh, it, I don't think it would maybe compare with Midway, but it was certainly one of the big ones uh, because we wiped out quite a few big Japanese warships that night. Uh, we had the, an assignment one time that was quite interesting and also a beautiful sight in, in some respects, but pretty tough in another. We were about 50 yards off Corregidor. <clears throat> Every time we'd see the glint of metal, we'd fire into that cave up there, hoping to wipe out the uh, Japanese snipers. And up, up above, about every three minutes, a huge airplane would come over and drop multicolored parachutes, white for our uh, paratroopers, uh, probably red for medical supplies, 
and they had another color for the guns and what have you that were coming up. But it was a beautiful sight. Every three minutes, they'd come over and drop a lot of this. Corregidor was a tabletop, a mesa. And if any one of our paratroopers missed that tabletop, he got down on the side hill. And next thing, we'd hear the, the crackling of rifle fire. They, they, they were shot. They were killed, without a doubt, every, everyone who missed that top. And once again, we were firing into that hillside like crazy with those five-inch shells from a short distance, hoping that uh, no one would still be alive in there. But they, they uh, as these gentlemen have indicated already, they were tough, some of the toughest fighters uh, that everyone could ever hope to encounter. Uh, in the Battle of uh, Leyte Gulf, I guess, uh, we were hit by a kamikaze about from here to the end of this little table about 15 feet off of our ship. So we, we were fortunate. We had one 40 millimeter gunner as the plane came in low and, and barely missed us. He was scalped and killed. We had, I think, two other deaths. I think three were killed, about 20 were injured. The gentleman that had my job on the number five mount, aft on the fantail, grabbed a hold of it, looked out the hatch about the time this plane hit. And they were filled with nails, tin cans, wire, anything they could find. And this guy's name was Gresham. He and I used to box together on the ship, and he'd knock my clock. He'd you know, beat me like to a pulp and just give, gave both of us a good workout. But anyway, the last time we saw Mr. Gresham, he was in Washington, D.C. We were sent there to celebrate Navy Day when the war was over. He was waiting for his 37th operation to remove shrapnel, and that wasn't the end of it. He still was uh, waiting to have something beyond number 37. So there about, you know, but for the grace of God, go I, so to speak. I was up front, he was back in the rear uh, when that uh, plane hit. Then we were sent to Okinawa to run the picket line up at Okinawa, and we got orders to, uh, when the atomic bombs were dropped uh, uh, and the war was basically over, we were ordered back to Washington, D.C. to celebrate Navy Day. And I have no qualms about the, uh, drop, uh, the dropping of the atomic bombs. I don't even bat an eye uh, that I saw the plans, the invasion plans for invading Japan. We would have lost a minimum of a half million more Americans and a lot more wounded. Uh, they, they, they would have waited out uh, on the, off the beaches uh, and had themselves armed or strapped with grenades or whatever. So, uh, so I, I did not question that. Maybe it could have been, maybe they could have dropped those bombs on a cornfield or, I mean, a rice field over there or something, I don't know. But once again, uh, I, for one, was very thankful uh, that uh, President Truman made that order. Uh, as we left uh, Okinawa, we got about 300 miles away and our ship was bouncing around quite a bit. They had a typhoon hit over there uh, on, the, on the island and pretty well wiped out all of our equipment or at least laid it low. So. Fortunately, uh, the war had been uh, pretty much declared officially over, or unofficially at least, so it was, was not uh, a big handicap for us. We celebrated Navy Day in Washington, D.C., and we were there for about two weeks. The women in Washington, D.C. outnumbered men nine to one at that time. Uh, I was just a young kid. I spent, unfortunately, I spent most of the time drinking. <laughs> Had, had I known then what I know now, I probably would have uh, realized my quota, but uh, <laughs> uh, and oh, I wanted to mention that uh, Pappy Boynton, uh, one time uh, a young lady in one of my classes at Carlsbad High School was named Boynton, so I said, Re any relation to Pappy Boynton? Because I was uh, well aware of, of, uh, of him, and she said, yes, he was my grandfather. So sometimes it's a small world in coming across somebody who had really close contact with him. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I was here last year. Dick was my buddy on my left. And when I met him the night, he said, well, we made it another year. <laughs> uh, and that's about the way it goes. Uh, When I came out of the Army in November of 45, uh, my wife-to-be said to me, Doug, you look just like a Greek god. After 51 years of marriage, she said, Doug, when you came home 51 years ago, 
You look like a Greek god, and today you just look like a damn Greek. <laughs> uh, uh, she was something else. Uh, we were married 51 years. This happens. I lost her nine years ago. She had emphysema. My mother died of emphysema. They both shared the same birthday, April the 19th. I was born on April the 28th. 1924, and when I married Dodie, she was 22 and I was 21. She was a year and nine days older, and I always told her I liked older women. <laughs> <laughs> but listen, we had a great married life, and uh, after 32 months in the Army, 26 months overseas, and uh, four and a half months on the Anzio beachhead. I feel privileged to be here tonight. I went back to Anzio in 1994 for the 50th anniversary. And Dodie couldn't go with me because the Apennines mountain is, Mountains are no place for anybody with emphysema. But fast backwards, I was at Lawrence College at Appleton, Wisconsin in September of 42. And I took English history I took English, I took Trig, and a couple other uh, senior major subjects, and physical ed. And I had an English professor, um, I had a history professor that was a professor of English history and he was a graduate of Oxford University. And after a month in his class, he said to me, uh, you don't seem to be with these 100-year wars or 50-year war of the roses or this, that, or the next thing. I said, well, I'll tell you, Professor Ramey, I'm more interested in what the Brits are doing in North Africa than I am in English history. In fact, I said, I'm registered for the draft, and I don't think I'm going to be in class too long. <laughs> well, I made it home for Christmas, and I got back on campus, and I was dedicated to the fact that I was going to knuckle down and get a few credits. And on March the 1st of 1943, I got greetings. Well, that was the end of my college education. I had four months of basic training at Mineral Wells, Texas. This was the home of the crazy crystals. Well, I'll tell you something, it was more than the home of the crazy crystals. By the time I finished basic training in heavy weapons, I said, I never want to come back to this state again. But let me tell you something, never say never. A company that I hired me from Dallas, Texas in 1957 promoted me in 1961. In 1961, I moved to Richardson, Texas, 17 miles north of Dallas and lived there for 30 years. 
I've got uh, five granddaughters and a great granddaughter. I've got a grandson and a great grandson. And I've got a granddaughter that I went back to Connecticut for her graduation last August. And we were sitting at the dining room table. And I told her the story about never say never. I said, and all of my granddaughters have been born in the state of Texas. And she sort of looked at me. And she said, Grandpa Doug, I was born in Connecticut. <laughs> so uh, at this stage of the game, uh, sometimes I say things that don't register. I sat on my couch this morning watching some TV and working a crossword puzzle. And I was thinking of uh, what my big chemical reaction was whenever I got in furry, <laughs> furry circumstances when I was in the Army. And it took me five hours before the word adrenaline popped into my head. When I finished my heavy weapons basic training, I got a nine-day pass to go home. It took me two days to get to Chicago. I had five days at home. And it took me two days to get back. So I decided I'd call Dodie Kirk. Dodie Kirk was the future Mrs. Cook. When she was 13, I couldn't stand her. We both went to the same Episcopal church. I sang in the choir at St. Saint what? <laughs> uh, you see, you get these brain waves, and at this stage of the game, it'll go right out in the right field. It's okay, Doug. We know it was a church. <laughs> it, it was the Episcopal Church. It'll come to me, I'll tell you. And uh, she called me after she knew me for about a month or two, the little twerp. <laughs> well, I was four foot eight tall when I graduated from, from grammar school. Uh, I grew a foot in high school. I couldn't stand her at 13, but at 18, she started looking pretty sharp. <laughs> so we dated while I was on pass. And she said she'd write me whenever I'd write her. And she kept me going for 32 months. In October of 44, I told my, wrote my mom an email. And uh, a V-mail, email. E emails weren't around in 1943. <laughs> a V-mail and told her to buy her an engagement ring. And she accepted it. Anyway, when I left Chicago, got back to Camp Walters, uh, one morning they said, pack up everything you own. You're leaving here today. They loaded us on express cars of a passenger train and put an MP at the end of every door. And we went from Mineral Wells, Texas, to Camp Shenango, Pennsylvania. At Camp Shenango in Pennsylvania, they gave us all of our overseas equipment. And in a day or two, we were on the New York port of embarkation. We joined a 146 ship convoy and we headed out. We didn't know we were, where we were going and everybody was second guessing. Well, when I saw the Rock of Gibraltar, I knew that was the Rock of Gibraltar. Africa was on our right, and we went to Iran, Africa. I went to Arzu, Africa, about 14 miles out of Oran. And there were 35,000 troops that were replacement troops 
for every division of the service that was overseas, all the way from infantry to quartermaster uh, to combat engineers to 82nd and 101st Airborne Divisions. And we knew something was up. The invasion of Sicily took place. I miss that. The invasion of Salerno took place. I miss that. And one day I said to this captain, uh, Captain, what's my problem? He says, you're not shipping out of here until you get citizenship papers. Well, <laughs> and this was new to me. I'm in the army and they decide when I'm in Africa, I'm not a citizen and I need citizenship paper. My whole family left the Ontario, Canada. I was a year old. I'd lived in the country for 17 out of my 18 years and I needed citizenship papers. So on number, November the 3rd, November the 3rd, of 1943, I became an American citizen ship in Arzu, North Africa. That's the hard way to get your papers. And as soon as I got those papers, I was on a ship heading for Naples, Italy. From Naples, Italy, right up to the front lines, on Mount Portia, about five or six miles south of Casino. And we were logger headed there for about four months. I was a machine gunner uh, for 10 days. One night, one of the officers came along and said, you on that gun, and you, and you, you, and you, we need litter bears. So I went from machine gun to litter bearer as a medic. And about after two weeks of that, I thought, I don't know anything about being a medic. But they said, well, we're pulling you off the line. We're going to the King's Palace grounds in Naples. We're gonna waterproof all of your vehicles and we're gonna make an invasion and we didn't know where. Anyway, I was made a driver on an ambulance. Well, that was better than being a walking litter bear over mountains and rocks and stones and ravines and every other <laughs> obstacle under the sun. And on D plus two, I landed on the Anzio beachhead. It was eight miles deep, 10 miles wide. The landing was made by the 3rd and the 45th Infantry Divisions. Combat A and Combat B of the 1st Armored Medical Corps were assigned to support those two visions as a medical outfit. And uh, Anzio was Winston Churchill's pipe dream, and that's what it turned out to be. We were going to get to Rome in 72 hours. Four months and 13 days later, we liberated Rome. So for four months and 13 days, we sat on that beachhead, and there was no rear echelon on the beachhead. German guns could hit anything under the sun. We were on land as flat as this table, and they were at a 3,800 elevation. And with German Bosch Lam binoculars, they could tell what we were eating for dinner. Everything went underground. Our vehicles were underground. My foxhole was called the Chapery that I shared with two other guys. One was Bill Pesca from Chicago, which made him a Chicago buddy. And the other one was Walter Thomas of uh, Kokomo, Indiana. 
The foxhole was six foot deep. It was eight by 10. It was covered with I-beams. It was covered with galvanized iron. It was covered with 300 sandbags and it was mounded with four feet of dirt. And we felt safe. Everybody in the service feels safe wherever they are. If they get that cozy feeling, those that were in the South Pacific were happy they were in the South Pacific. Those of us that were in the ETO were happy we were in the ETO and not in the South Pacific. And all the time I got my draft notice, I wanted to be in the Navy. Well, I'll tell you what, not being a citizen, I couldn't be in the Navy, but I could be in the Army. <laughs> Don't ask me. Don't ask me why. <clears throat> but I'll tell you what, the landing in Anzio was unopposed. The 3rd Infantry and the 45th Infantry Divisions went ashore off of Higgins' boats after they unloaded off the transports over the ropes. When I came into the Anzio Harbor, D plus two. About 85 ships were out at the sea and they could only bring four ships in at a time to unload. And we got called in to unload. The warning signals went up and we went through five air raids before we got ashore. The first one, I dove under an army half-track loaded with 155 ammunition. And when that one ended and I saw what I was under, I thought, well, that's a dumb place to be. <laughs> the second air raid, I went below deck, about three decks, and we're sitting on a bunk in our first combat. We're shaking so bad, it looked as if we had St. Vitus dance. And I look on a, up, and it says, ammunition ship storage. Well, I got the hell out of there. <laughs> I think on the fourth air raid, I think on the fourth air raid, uh, I saw a chaplain and I followed him. When I got to shore, I kissed the ground and I never wanted to be back in the Navy. We went from there to the Brenner Pass and my time's up. But ask me later about Andy Granatelli of STP and my villa in the sun in Tuscany, and you'll get a kick out of it. Thank you much. Okay, I was, I was born in a little town upstate New York, uh, Liberty, New York. Uh, when I was a kid there, the population was about 5,000 people. Uh, I was inducted into the Army, uh, drafted in 1943, in May of 1943. <clears throat> took my basic training in Camp Wheeler, Georgia, which is just outside of Macon, Georgia. I understand now, I've never been back there, but I understand now that that's a big shopping center or something. A lot of those uh, basic training camps were deactivated after the war. Uh, toward, the end of, uh, <coughs> toward the end of my uh, uh, basic training, uh, an officer came up from Fort Benning to parachute school. And at that time, paratroopers were the only ones who wore boots and, uh, and he looked so sharp, and he was uh, recruiting people to join the Airborne, and uh, painted a rosy picture about jumping, floating down, and all this, and <laughs> in uniform like this. And at that time, I was making $26 a month, and when he said that the Airborne got 50 bucks a month more for jumping out of airplanes, that was the thing that turned me on. I tripled my salary just like that. Uh, one thing I could not understand is the officers got $75 for jumping out of the same airplane. <laughs> I was sent to Fort Benning, Georgia for parachute training. And while you, you have to, uh, the class is cycled, you have to wait for a class to open up. And they put you in an area called a frying pan. It's a tent city. And it's right adjacent to the airport. And we were there in uh, like July and early August uh, of 1943. And you can imagine uh, what the weather's like in Georgia in August, July of August 1943, and that was why that place was apropos called the frying pan. Uh, 
clay. We ran everywhere. I ran to the mess hall. You, you, were, you know, force marches, force running all the time, and uh, a lot of calisthenics. Then when the uh, class opened up, uh, extremely rigorous training, uh, rope climbing, again, calisthenics. Uh, you, we had mock-up towers, 36-foot mock-up towers. You learned how to exit out of a door and how to position your body when you jumped out of an airplane. They had 250-foot towers that uh, we, we jumped off. If we didn't jump, they hauled us up in a cable and released us. Uh, and you learned how to steer a parachute. They were slightly maneuverable, not very much. And the last week of our training, we went to the rigging section and learned how to pack a parachute. Uh, you packed your parachute, and then you jumped it the next day. And then you, you were off for the day, except you had to go back and pack the parachute that you were going to jump the following day. Uh, that was the only time I ever packed a parachute when, during jump school. When, you, when you're assigned to a unit, they have what they call a rigging section, and they pack all your parachutes and, and make sure they're okay. Uh, relying on somebody else, that's the ultimate, relying on somebody else's expertise. Uh, you jump a parachute that somebody else packed. Uh, at the end of a four-week period, we, uh, we got our jump wings and our, our boots, and that uh, was a very, very proud moment for me. Uh, I, uh, you know, we, we were airborne, we were kind of in a class by ourselves. Uh, at that time, I was assigned to 551st Parachute Infantry Battalion in Camp McCall, North Carolina. We were a separate battalion. Uh, and what that means, you usually, uh, they can bounce you wherever they want. They can attach you to whatever division or whatever they, that they want to. Uh, it's a very maneuverable a unit because it's small. About 800, 850 men is a, a full strength per, uh, parachute battalion. Uh, while at Camp McCall, did a lot of training, a lot of practice jumps, uh, firing range, all kinds of weapons, machine guns, mortars, and BARs, uh, even jumped out of gliders, these CG4 gliders. They were experimenting, uh, towing two gliders behind one C-47 and everybody jumping at once. And uh, those gliders were built like model airplanes. I'll tell you, I was ever so glad to get out of the in my life. Uh, strange thing about that is when you jump out of a C-47, you go out the door and there's a big radial engine right here and the, the prop blast from that opens your parachute quite quickly. <clears throat> when you go out of a glider, you don't have that prop blast, so you drop further. And there are a number of guys who were jerking the reserve sheets because they thought their main chute had not opened. It took a little longer for it to open. Uh, in uh, April of 1944, uh, we, we sailed uh, out of uh, Newport, Newport News, Virginia, and landed in Oran, Africa. Uh, we were, you said, part of the Airborne. We were there probably at the same time you were, maybe. Uh, went from there to Naples and Sicily, training all the time. We were constantly training. Uh, left Sicily and we went to, uh, we took 40 and 8 trains up to Rome. Uh, they named 40 and 8 trains, they're boxcars, and uh, uh, the French, this is from World War I, they would hold uh, 8 horses or 40 men. And, uh, and they had been used for both, and you could smell the horses, and there were no toilet facilities at, at all in them, no cooking facilities, we had these little gas stoves that we used. Uh, K rations and C rations to eat. Uh, one experience we had, <coughs> another was only a single track, so when the train was coming the other way, they'd have to pull you over to the siding and let the train go by. And this was in uh, early August. You know, I'm trying to think, I'm, I'm not sure of the date. We pulled off this siding, and all we'd been eating was K rations and C rations, and we were right along a fig orchard. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, the, and the figs were ripe. And, and we got out and we loaded up on figs and we suffered for it and all the way to the rest of Rome, I'll tell you. Again, I mentioned no toilet facility. You slid the door open on that thing and stuck your butt out and that's, that's the way that went. And, and, and in your K-rations, you got a little packet of toilet paper. I don't know if you remember that or not. There's a little fold of paper. That was about the size of a Kleenex, you know. So needless to say, things got a little messy in that 40 and 8. Uh, August 15th, we went to an airport just north of Rome and loaded up uh, 
full equipment and flew out across uh, Sardinia and Corsica and, and parachuted in into southern France, about 20 miles inland. Uh, the reason airborne, and the same thing at Normandy, the reason airborne jumps inland is the, the core headquarters and so forth and control all the armament that's on the beaches are generally inland. They're all of the uh, divisional headquarters and all that kind of stuff. And the, the job of the airborne is to jump inland and disrupt any transportation or, or signals and telephones and so forth to the beaches so that later when the troops come in, the 45th Division was one of them landed there, we try to disrupt their communications and everything. That's the idea. You jump inland, you're surrounded by the enemy. Your first thing is to establish a perimeter. Uh, when I landed, I missed the drop zone, and uh, I landed in a grape vineyard for, uh, adjacent to the drop zone. I fortunately landed between the wires. And I don't know why to this day I did this, but I took my knife and I cut a panel out of my parachute. And I had that tied around my waist. I had to, the, we carried a musette bag, a little bag. I had this big, it's a big hunk of nylon. And every little farm and village that we liberated, the women were coming out. They wanted the material. And uh, a short while, we realized what was happening. They had been under German rule for four years. They had no material to make clothes. They were using parachute nylon to make underwear and dresses and so forth. I finally got down where I had just a little piece of it left. I stuck it in my musette bag. And uh, at a later date after the war, I was in Nice, and I had a woman embroider my wife's initials on it. This is a piece of the parachute that I actually jumped into France with right here. And I had my wife's initials embroidered on it here. You know, I also hung a piece of parachute. You can get an eye, it's quite flimsy. You can come up and feel that after if you'd like. Uh, the next day we attacked uh, the city of Dragonion, which is where the German Corps headquarters were for the beaches. Uh, captured uh, a German general in, that, in the process and liberated that city. From there, we moved southwest <coughs> down along the river. We, we liberated uh, towns like Antibes, cities like Caen, Nice, uh, for Jews. And then we went back up into the Maritime Alps. And we, we were pushing Ger Germans back. And of course, they were from Italy, they were pushing them up into the Alps. And we were pushing, and we had them kind of uh, up in these mountains. And there was, because of the mountainous terrain, you couldn't use tanks, and there was not too much artillery. And we did a lot of patrol work. They were sending patrols, and we were sending patrols and capturing troops and so forth. Uh, in mid-November, we were relieved uh, there and went up north. And we were supposed to be in R&R. &R. We had been in, in uh, combat since August 15th, from August 15th to mid-November, without any uh, rest at all. We'd get a weekend or something to go down into uh, to Nice. <coughs> and then uh, we were playing a Christmas party when Hitler decided to uh, go with the Battle of the Bulge. And we were thrown right into the heart of that. Uh, we got a counterattack uh, positions. We had summer uniforms, but we'd been down in southern France. The, the Ardent Forest was bitter, bitter cold. It was one of the coldest winters in history. Uh, I think David here knows a little bit about that too. You were there. It was, the snow was averaged about calf deep, and it was terribly, terribly cold. Uh, we attacked the small towns, and over a four-day period, uh, we, I felt no, no heat whatsoever for four days. And we finally, the straw that broke the camel's back, we attacked, we attacked the little town, Belgian town of Rochelinval. We'd started out with 825 people, and we came out of there with 105 men. We lost over four-fifths of men, men. There were so few people left that they just deactivated the unit. Spent two months in the hospital back in England. Uh, came back in 1945 as a, uh, with the 505 of the 82nd Airborne Division. Uh, fought on across Germany, across the Elbe River where we met the Russians. We went from there, we went into Berlin. And uh, the Berlin at that time was divided into four sectors, French, <coughs> English, Russian, and American. The 82nd Airborne Division was a military presence for the United States in Berlin. And uh, I was there, and uh, there was a point system. You, you depend on the number of days you'd been, where they'd been wounded, and so forth, and you accumulated points. When you got enough points, they sent you home. Uh, 
Uh, I came home in December. I was discharged the day after Christmas in December of 1945, having spent a little less than two years overseas. I was married before I went over, uh, and I'm still married today, and my wife, we were married last March 62 years. And uh, so that's the end of my little story. If you have any questions after, I'll be glad to answer them. One thing I'd like to show you that I carried with me all the time, <coughs> Zippo lighter. Still works. <laughs> <laughs> it's all worn off. You can take a look at that after if you'd like. But you don't smoke anymore. I do not smoke. I haven't <laughs> smoked in, everybody smoked in those days. But. Yeah.